What's going on, everybody? Welcome on into the Matt Lombardo Show presented by Heavy Sports. I'm Heavy Sports NFL Insider Matt Lombardo. Great to have you here. We have a big show on tap. We have Pro Football Hall of Famer, Denver Broncos legend, two-time Super Bowl champion Terrell Davis will join us. We'll get his thoughts on some of the best running backs in the game today. We'll break down all of the moves, the biggest winners from the NFL trade deadline, and what a deadline it was. A lot of moves went down. All of the talk leading into Tuesday from agents and people inside the league to me was, uh, it's a lot of smoke, not going to be a lot of fire, a lot of talk, not a lot of moves. No, 10 trades went down to the deadline. I'll give you my biggest winners, and we'll be joined by 2000 NFL Executive of the Year, current heavy sports contributor Randy Mueller, friend of the podcast, to get his thoughts on the trade deadline, who he thought helped themselves the most, which team boosted their Super Bowl chances, the the teams that went all out to make the big moves, the moves that he kind of questioned. We'll get his thoughts on all of it. And if you enjoy the podcast, we'd really appreciate it if you went ahead and subscribed to the Apple Podcast Store, Spotify, SoundCloud, throw us a like on YouTube, and leave those five-star reviews. Let us know what you like about the show, some potential guests that you'd like to have on, and we'll go ahead and get them. Those five-star reviews, we really appreciate them, and they really help grow the show. But without further ado, let's check in with Terrell Davis. Joining us on the Matt Lombardo Show, Pro Football Hall of Famer, NFL legend, Denver Broncos legend, Terrell Davis joins us. Terrell, how you doing, man? I'm doing, I'm doing great. How you guys doing? Doing great. Happy to have you here. And I know that you're coming to us on behalf of NFL Blitz Legends, an exciting game that I can't wait to try out. I know that you probably have been playing it since the 90s. Um, but before I get into all of that, I was just curious your thoughts on some of the current running backs around the league. When you look at this crop of generational backs, who's the guy that you think is most likely to wind up with his bust next to yours in Canton? Oh, <laughs> well, there's a guy that's, that's trending in that direction, and that's Derek Henry. I mean, he's yeah, every week you're looking at the game and there's some milestone that he's broken and it's always bringing up some of the great running backs to have done what he's doing. You know, he reached 2000 yards a few years ago. Um, he's constantly, I think at 200 something yards the other day. So Derek Henry's probably the closest to that right now. Uh, but I, I like the other running backs like Dalvin Cook for the, for the Vikings right there. I think Christian McCaffrey with the Niners right now is, is the guy to look out for. Um, Saquon Barkley is, is, you know, he's gotten off to a slow, a fast start and got injured, but I think he's starting to get back on track. So there's a lot of backs that I, I enjoy watching, but I think if I had to, if I had to put money on it right now, I would say that King Henry would be the next one to, to get the, get the jacket, get the bronze bust. So uh, he, he would be my guy. I think it's a great pick and obviously one of the more dominant running backs in the game today. Of course, you mentioned Saquon Barkley. How impressive is what he's doing this year, putting all the injuries behind him? He's a focal point in that offense again, in the passing game, in the wildcat even. How impressed are you by what Saquon Barkley is doing right now? You know, I guess I wouldn't say I'm impressed a lot. And the reason I said is because I expect that from him. That, that's sure. what I expect from him from day one. And, you know, he, when he had the injury, you know, the last year when he came back, he wasn't, he wasn't fully hell healthy. And I, I understand I've, I've had an injury before with the knee and it really does take you a full a whole season and then an off season to, to strengthen your, your knee and then come back um, until you're really, really ready to play. So what I've seen is the same guy I saw at Penn state, he's the same guy I saw his rookie season. So not to say that, I mean, I'm, I'm glad he's back, but I expect him to be like that. What I'm saying is not, it's not like, oh, I'm shot. No, no, no. That's what Saquon uh, looks like when he's healthy. Yeah, he certainly looks like what he was at Penn State. They're getting him the ball in space, creating opportunities for him. And another guy who's having a great year, you mentioned him, is your list of favorite running backs. There's Christian McCaffrey. Yeah. You know, I watched Christian McCaffrey, even when he was in Carolina. He seems like a guy who's tailor-made for Kyle Shanahan. Now he gets to be in that scheme. Outside of the Eagles, who are probably the most complete team in the NFC, that conference is wide open. What kind of a difference maker is Christian McCaffrey to that 49ers team with what he's able to do? Oh, he's huge because he, he fills a, uh, a void between, you know, your passing game and your run game. You know what I'm saying? So the, so the run game is, is strictly a guy who can run the stretch zone, somebody can run the backfield. And then you obviously have your receivers that they run down the field. But when you can have somebody who is – uh, who as, is as dynamic as Christian, 
We saw the other day where he's throwing past halfback passes for touchdowns. His his route running is is probably the best out there when it comes to to running backs. Him and maybe Alvin Kamara runs they run really good routes. So to have him in a in your toolbox, if you're Kyle Shanahan, man, he's gonna put him in a lot of situations where he's gonna be able to make plays. So I think that's a huge difference for for the 49ers. Makes them um you know one of the favorites, I believe, to come out of the NFC West. Uh and I think it also puts them up there in the overall. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. And and real quick, just on your former team, the Denver Broncos, they go over to London, they get the win over the Jaguars. But how do they turn it around? It seems like there's been so much turmoil around the head coaching situation. Russell Wilson has been pretty inconsistent. What do you make of your former team and what the Broncos are and how they kind of form an identity from here? Yeah, it's a you know, it's a process. I live here in Denver and I'm, I'm you know, I've, all, I've watched them. Um, and we, we want instant gratification. Uh, we want we want things to come in and gel week one. And the reality of it is it doesn't work that way. When you have a new head coach, you have new quarterback, you have a lot of new pieces, you know, basically a GM has only been here two years, new ownership now. Um, so yeah, it's going to take, it's going to take a process to figure out how this, this team goes about, you know, goes about it the next couple of weeks, but it did, you pick up a good win in London and you have a, you have a bye week and then come back and play the Titans. So now it's just building on what they've done, you know, eliminate, the mistakes, they, they have a, a ton of penalties in the game to me, which they have to get rid of. You know, that's what they need sure. to focus on. No penalties or at least reduce those penalties. And then focus on the three drives they had last week that were really, really good. You had a 98 yard drive, you finished in the red zone, build off those things. And hopefully those things translate to you getting into more games and, and being closer and then pulling those games out. So I, I'm not, I'm confident that they'll figure this thing out. And, um, but we'll see when they come back and play. And speaking of games, you obviously partnered up with Arcade One Up on the NFL Blitz home game. This thing is awesome. It's phenomenal. It definitely brings back some nostalgia for me. Tell me about the game. Tell me how often you fire this thing up in your house. Yeah, this is the first time they made Blitz available for home. You know, this is this game is console is is specifically designed to be in your home. It's not the the, the you know the regular size. It's a small size um, console. But it, it, it takes you back to, uh, you know, to me, I get nostalgia when I'm, when I'm playing this game. You know, I grew up in, in when we had arcades where we didn't yeah. have, you didn't have home, you didn't have the home console. You just go to the arcade and spend all day in the arcade. So for me, it kind of brings that back. Uh, I love the, I love the, you know, the style of it. You know, uh, NFL Blitz has always been a game that was a little bit kind of cutting edge in terms of more action. The pace of the game was more, was more frantic, uh, more exciting to play this game. Um, you know, just the hits were bigger, the the runs were, <laughs> were tougher. So th- that's what this is what's, what's fun about this video game. And so I encourage everybody to go go to rk1up.com and uh, it's available now. Get your get your console and you can play it now. What's cool about this? You can now play this on the internet. You can play other people. You can play not a, not just the game itself, but uh, your friends all over the place. You, you guys can play against each other which is cool yeah you and you and i gotta fire it up at some point too we, we already have that on the agenda you know i gotta take down td and stuff and you you would obviously rush for 100 yards in a game i might not rush for 100 inches but in, in nfl blitz i might have a shot at you. see that's the thing <laughs> now that it's a level playing field and we both we, we both play this game knowing that this is you know obviously physically we couldn't be out there playing but it gives you it gives you a little bit of that excitement like you are playing at least for me i feel like i, I can play this game and you know, I kind of think of myself still on the field. Of course, I play with number 30, the Broncos, and uh, I, I get about 20 touches a game. So I'm, I'm always going to feed myself and see see what I can do with the ball. Well, I was going to say, other than number 30, other than TD and the gold jacket, other than the Broncos, who are your go-to teams and players other than yourself to fire up when you turn on the concert? It, it might sound selfish, but it's just me. I don't want <laughs> to... <laughs> Nobody else. Now, my quarterback is going to be number seven, John Elwin, all the time. Yeah, I, I kind of I like playing with, you know, I like I just like being me out there. That's all. And the other cool thing about this is I have I have young kids now. So I have an 11-year-old son and a uh, nine-year-old son. My daughter's seven. She messes around. But those two, they're playing this game. And for them to see me on a console, like they, they know who I am. I think they're starting to understand over the years. But this gives them a, a, a greater sense for oh that 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 was pretty good that was pretty good you know I'm on I'm on the side of the the panel uh, and now I'm in the <laughs> game playing playing as me 
And so I think it's pretty cool for, for, my, for me to see my sons experience this. Awesome. He's Terrell Davis. Terrell, one more time, tell everybody where they can get the console, get NFL Blitz, and get it shipped to their house. Yeah, arcade1up.com. You can ship it to your house. Go there right now. Get it before Christmas time. Trust me, you do not – you do want this in your house. You don't want to go without this for Christmas. I'm telling your kids are going to go crazy over it. It's going to take you back to the days where you go to the arcade, put the quarters in the machine. Man, I'm telling you, it's been fun. It's been fun having this. So go get yours. He's Terrell Davis. Appreciate the time, my man. Look forward to talking to you further up the road. And good luck playing NFL Blitz. I'll see you out there. I appreciate it. Great stuff there from TD and just an absolute legend. I still remember some of my favorite Super Bowl memories growing up as a kid, throwing the Super Bowl party with all my friends from school, watching John Elway and Terrell Davis take out Brett Favre and the Packers, watching them win the second Super Bowl against the Atlanta Falcons. I was pulling hard for Randall Cunningham to get there, man, and that magical Minnesota Vikings team, but not to be Terrell Davis you know, I always remember that moment where he got knocked out of the game with the migraines in the Super Bowl and came back in and rushed for something like 150 yards and won the MVP. Definitely, definitely inspiring stuff. But moving ahead to this NFL season and the landscape of this NFL, this was one of the more interesting and compelling trade deadlines that I can remember in some time because you had contending teams making legitimate moves to legitimately help their playoff chances down the stretch here. And, and, you know, there were four teams, I think, that helped themselves the most. And I think number one, first and foremost, was the San Francisco 49ers. And I've talked to a lot of people about what the 49ers that I've talked to, personnel executives, longtime scouts, agents, coaches. And the opinion is pretty widespread in that I'm not sure that there's a team who made a bigger impact on their 2022 chances of going to the postseason, making a run at the postseason, maybe going further than that, than the 49ers by going out and getting Christian McCaffrey. And we're going to touch on McCaffrey in a lot more detail later on in this podcast. But his debut, what he did on Sunday afternoon, he was every bit the difference maker and more than that, that the 49ers expected to get. He was every bit the ideal fit for Kyle Shanahan's scheme. And I wrote about it going into that trade, coming out of that trade, going into his first game last week, that he was made to be in that scheme. His skill set, his versatility, the way that the 49ers run the ball, the way that they stretch defenses out horizontally, he's made to maximize all of that. And when you look at the roster that they have, I know there might be some question marks with Jimmy Garoppolo long-term and just how far he can take them this year. He's taking them to a Super Bowl at a conference title game. So that has to count for something from a win standpoint from your quarterback, from Jimmy Garoppolo. But that San Francisco defense is absolutely loaded. And I'm not so sure if I'm a defensive coordinator how you defend an offense that includes Debo Samuel, George Kittle, Brandon Ayuk, and now Christian McCaffrey. I don't even care what the price was. McCaffrey was absolutely worth it. The 49ers are in a position to compete for a Super Bowl, and they might have been a versatile running back away from getting there. McCaffrey elevates those chances significantly. They're in the mix now. They have all the components to be a dangerous team that you do not want to face in the postseason. And the second team that I think really helped their causes, and this shouldn't come as a a surprise if you listen to this show or read my columns on heavy.com or follow me on Twitter at Matt Lombardo NFL, Howie Roseman has done a masterful job dating back to the offseason. Howie Roseman's moves are the reason why the Eagles are the last undefeated team. They're all in. And everyone I've spoken to inside the league loves the Eagles' pickup of Robert Quinn. He's just another pass rusher, a pretty dominant pass rusher in that sense, in a really dominant front seven for the Eagles that's loaded with talent. Robert Quinn's not going to face the double teams that he did in Chicago this year once Khalil Mack got traded to the Chargers. He's not going to play the same amount of snaps that he played in the Bears' defense either. At this point, Robert Quinn is a situational pass rusher. The Eagles got him relatively on the cheap. They got the Bears to pick up a decent amount of his remaining salary. And Quinn is now a guy that the Eagles can line up on either side of the line of scrimmage. And in a similar way to how the Buffalo Bills use Von Miller, they can turn Robert Quinn loose on third down. They can turn him loose late in series, late in games, when offensive lines are starting to get tired a little bit. They can throw Robert Quinn out there with Brandon Graham and Fletcher Cox and Hassan Reddick and say, hey, hey guys, go race to the quarterback. 
it's pretty obvious what the Eagles are trying to do here. And this is a perfect fit for what they need. An AFC scouting director called it one of his favorite moves that any team made going into the deadline. Said, quote, you can't ever have enough pass rushers, and Quinn's a big get. I agree. Jonathan Gannon, to me, is in a position now to potentially land some head coaching interviews and maybe a head coaching job after what the job he's done so far with the Eagles defense, and now he gets another big piece. The Chicago Bears. I'm going to get into this with Randy Mueller a little bit later on and pick his brain because I have a very interesting take on the Chicago Bears. I think the Bears kind of threaded the needle here. They were never going to extend Robert Quinn. They weren't going to lock Roquan Smith up long term. And trading them both makes them a little bit worse this year. But here's the thing. It's not about this year. The Bears don't care about this year. They kind of are what they are. And Ryan Poles, to me did exactly what he needed to do in this spot at this particular trade deadline. Chicago unloaded some expensive contracts for players who were going to walk at the end of the season. You were just going to get a compensatory pick for them a year down the line. They wound up getting a second and a fifth round pick for Smith and a fourth round pick for Robert Quinn. So you added to your draft capital. And they also, at the same time, they made their defense a little bit worse. Big deal. Nobody has more cap space than the Bears do this coming offseason to go and spend and go buy help on defense. Who cares? Who cares what the defense is this year? If you lose two or three more games, great. You help Justin Fields. They weren't anything, they weren't going to win anything right now in 2022. They flipped one of those second round picks to go and get big time help for their young quarterback, Justin Fields. Trading a second round pick to the Steelers for Chase Claypool, friend of the show. But Claypool was a big target in the red zone, who has the speed to stretch the field a little bit. You saw it in Pittsburgh. And he has great hands. I've loved him since he first stepped on the field in Pittsburgh. I thought he was one of the more underrated receivers in the NFL. Now he gets to go catch passes from Justin Fields. You drop him into a receiving core with another weapon in Darnell Mooney, who the Bears are really enthusiastic about and confident that they're going to be able to sign to an extension when he's eligible before the start of next season. But you kind of have the foundation of something now. You have the start of a young receiving core that you can build around. And I don't think the Bears made any of these moves with 2022 at the top of their mind. They shouldn't have been. That shouldn't have been the thought process. The thought process for Ryan Poles needed to be, how do I help my young quarterback? How do I get better in 2023 and 2024? And they did it. They created some cap space for the offseason, not that they really needed it. They got a weapon that they have under team control for at least two years. He's a free agent after this year. You can franchise him after that if you can't extend him. And they added some draft capital. What more do you want? I like what the Bears did. We'll see if Randy Mueller agrees a little bit later on. Finally, the Miami Dolphins. I thought the Dolphins, I think they really positioned themselves to make some noise in the AFC after this deadline. Because Bradley Chubb, you talk to people in and around Denver, people in that building, people who follow that team closely. Bradley Chubb desperately needed a change of scenery. The Dolphins really needed an edge rusher to pair opposite Jalen Phillips, who, by the way, Jalen Phillips is a top 12 or so pass rusher in the game right now. And Miami now gets to plant Chubb on the other side. Chubb already has five and a half sacks, playing in a Denver defense that was asked to do a lot, and they were on the field a lot because Russell Wilson and that offense couldn't control the ball. Couldn't really score. Defense was put in a lot of bad spots. And you look at this move from Bradley Chubb's perspective, he gets to go and have a real chance at making a playoff run after playing for one of the worst teams in the league this year. And I asked a personnel executive what he thought of this trade, and he told me the Dolphins got their Von Miller, someone they can turn loose on third downs or late in games, similar to what the Eagles got in Robert Quinn. But the Dolphins now, They're going to be a factor in the AFC East race. I don't know that they catch the Bills. They beat them in Miami, and that's fine, but they still have some ground to make up, and I don't know that they're going to beat them twice the second time around in Buffalo, potentially on a cold, miserable night on the banks of Lake Erie. But they have a real chance now, the Dolphins do, of being one of the top wildcard spots in the AFC. Those chances got a lot better after they added Bradley Chubb. Love the move. 
So my four biggest winners at the NFL trade deadline are the San Francisco 49ers, the Philadelphia Eagles, the Chicago Bears, and the Miami Dolphins in that order. Great stuff earlier chatting with Terrell Davis, but I'm really excited to welcome back into the self-coined Lombardo Lounge, the creator of the moniker, the 2000 NFL Executive of the Year and Heavy.com contributor, Randy Mueller joins us now. You can follow him on Twitter at Randy Mueller underscore to break down everything that went down at the NFL trade deadline. You heard my takes. Let's hear from somebody who's actually been in the GM chair. Randy, how you doing, man? I am doing great. I'm looking forward to that Lombardo lounge on the deck with a cigar and a drink one of these days. So that's what I'm shooting for. That's that's where I want to be in life, right there. Dude, I am all in. All in. We'll, we'll find a spot. I, I know you're out in Idaho. I'll, I'll book the flight. I'll bring the cigars. You make sure you have the scotch and we'll, uh, there you go. we'll record this live out there. I'm all in. Ready to roll. So- there you go. So of, of all the trades that went down, what was your favorite move either, either going into the trade deadline or that went down on Tuesday afternoon? Well, I don't know about favorite, but there's a couple that were interesting. The, the trade of TJ Hawkinson in the, it's in their own division kind of got my eyes a little bit. I mean, that doesn't happen very often where a team trades to a division rival. Um I understand why Detroit did it. I'm not sure I would have done it and then have to face him two times every year. But there's a, a sense of confidence there that uh, Dan Campbell wants a certain type of a tight end. And he was one himself. So that criteria is probably different for him than it is for most. But he wants that blue collar, knockdown, blocking, run, you know, run first type tight end. And maybe TJ is more of a receiver, a little more of a space player. I get it. So that one was a little bit interesting to me. The one that I think created the most to do with all the deals was obviously the Bradley Chubb thing from Denver. I've kind of been in that chair of George Payton. and, And I'll just say this, George and I worked for Nick Saban in Miami. So we were under one of the all-time best when it comes to doing what he does. But Nick's thing to us for the whole time we were there with him was it's all about fit. And for front seven players, it is all about fit. So we've heard, we've seen all of the hub hub made about Bradley Chubb being a a pass rusher, 5.5 sacks already, you know, this and that, uh, being an elite rusher that puts Miami over the edge. I like the move for both teams, and I like it for Miami and would never dispute that. I wouldn't push back on that. But I'll say this about the Denver angle and this long-winded answer to your question, but it's all about fit for George and for what they're doing in Denver. Bradley Chubb is not a linebacker. They play a 3-4 defense in Denver. He's suited best to be an end in a four-man rush and a four-man sub package, and that's what he does best. I remember him from my days scouting at NC State That was the question coming out about Bradley Chubb. And I'm not making this about him not being a player because he is. I get it. He's a good player. But it is about fit and what your scheme calls for defensively. He's always been a little bit of an upright player, um, better with his hand on the ground, less effective in chase when he has to play back off the line of scrimmage. And what it told me was it wasn't a perfect fit for them going forward in Denver. And what put me to that point was George said yesterday, George Payton, the GM of the Broncos said, it didn't matter what our record was. This was just a good move for us. In other words, it wasn't a perfect fit and he wasn't going to be able to pay him a year from now, $20 million a year. That to me feels like the biggest takeaway from the Denver side is you have a guy who was incredibly productive as a rookie, fought through some injuries. You brought up the five and a half sacks already this year. If you can't bring Bradley Chubb back, if you know that you're not going to extend him and you're going to lose him for a third round compensatory pick in 2024 or whenever it is, a year from now, I think you have to make that deal every time. They Mm -hmm. they got an asset to keep building. Um, They they moved on from a player who probably needs a change of scenery. And from the Miami standpoint, you get to put him opposite of Jalen Phillips and you have a pretty decent one-two pass rush there now. Yes. I agree with that. I think Miami's more advanced in their team building plan right now as well. I think we've yeah. seen what Denver is. They have issues. Plus, we also know where the cap number is going on Russell Wilson next year. And let's face it, he's not going anywhere. So we no. can complain about him. We complain about these quarterbacks all the time, whether it's Justin Fields or Zach Wilson or Russell Wilson. They're not going anywhere. 
They're with their team. So we're not using the rest of this year to decide if if they're in the plans. Trust me, they're in the plans because their contract says they are. So I think in Denver's case, it did make sense. I understand we don't want to get rid of good players. That's always been my mantra forever. We're not letting good players walk out. But there's reasons why they did this that actually make sense to me. The other thing is, and I've been in this position, I traded Chris Chambers, a receiver from the Miami Dolphins, on trade deadline to San Diego one year. And we weren't very good in Miami that year. And everybody said, oh, you're throwing in the towel. You're giving up. Really, we weren't. It, it was. We, we weren't very good. I get it. But right. going forward, I knew we had other options and there's a chance to collect something for a player that wouldn't be with us. So I think Denver feels like they have other options. You know, they've drafted a third round pick a couple years ago, a kid named Draymond Jones, who plays inside, outside, up, down. He's a very versatile piece that probably nobody's heard of. But they have a couple guys like this that I know their scheme fits really well. So they have other options. And that's why they I'm not putting this guy in Von Miller's category, but that's why they were able to move a Von Miller and a Bradley Chase because they have Bradley Chubb because they have other options. Yeah, and I think that in Miami, he gets to occupy that kind of a role where he's not playing every snap. He's going yes. in on third downs and, and obvious pass rush downs late in games. <laughs> you know, moving on from Denver. Which team helped themselves the most? Which team do you think helped themselves the most at the deadline? It's it's hard to say. I'm not sure that the trades yesterday were should be the only measuring stick. I think there oh, were some sure. trades that led up to yesterday that you know make sense for some teams. Um, obviously, Miami's addition of of the running back from San Francisco, uh, Wilson is yep. a guy that Mike McDaniel is very familiar with and gives him two backs now that really know his system. I think that helps add to how good Miami may be prepared to be down the stretch. So I would definitely say Miami has helped themselves this year, but it comes at a price and they're all in, you know, they're not going to have a first round pick next year, but I think they're okay with that. And I like the fact that they've been aggressive. So I think without a doubt, you have to answer the question by saying Miami's better and probably pro propels them into that elite top three or four in the AFC right now. Yeah, I think so too. It puts them right in the mix. It makes them a factor in the playoff race. And a couple minutes before you came on, Randy, I pointed out how much I really liked what the Bears did because they went out, they got Chase Claypool to give Justin Fields a legitimate weapon who he desperately needed. They desperately needed, we talked about this last time, to put some weapons around him. You now have Chase Claypool, you now have Darnell Mooney. You've created some flexibility in 2023 from both the draft capital and a salary cap standpoint because you weren't bringing Roquan Smith back. You weren't bringing back uh, Robert Quinn. Yeah, I kind of like what Ryan Poles pulled off. What, what do you say about that and what they did? I, I understand the moves and I'm endorsing of those moves. Um, I guess it depends to me on how they fill these seats going forward. I want to see how this team build continues to fall out. And I don't think it's just about picking players in the draft. They've got to find a way to build the rest of this team. I, I get the clay pool pool stuff. I don't know that we're ready to start giving Justin Fields weapons right now. I just think there are some things offensive line wise, some other things schematically on defense that we got to do better. So I get it. It's a chance to get Claypool, you know, a year early because they would have had to probably draft one fairly high next year. I understand that. And they do have some other draft capital going forward, but I'm going to wait to endorse these moves until I see how the rest of the team build goes going forward, if that makes any sense. Do, do you see them sticking with Justin Fields? Because again, we've talked about this before you and I on the podcast and off. Ryan Poles and Matt Aberflus, they didn't draft Justin Fields and, and they didn't exactly spend the offseason building around him. They certainly have let the offensive line kind of kind of wither. They, they yeah. haven't added no, there no. and they bring in Chase Claypool, which I think helps them a lot with Mooney. But do you think part of that equation is they're still trying to figure out whether Justin Fields is their future? I think Justin Fields is their future. And if they don't realize that now, after the last couple of weeks, I don't know that they ever will. But two weeks ago was the first time I ever saw a Chicago Bear coaching staff put together a game plan that actually fits the skills of their quarterback. So I right. think we've been trying to r ram a square peg in a round hole for a year and a half in Chicago. Not all on this staff, but at least these guys finally got it to where now Justin Fields has a chance. I think you can see it in his body language. You can see it in his facial expressions. The kid is genuinely 
buying in now to what they've done the last couple of weeks. So I think it's a big change. And to answer your question, yes, I think Justin Fields is the future in Chicago and that coaching staff has to, has to find a way to author a system that accentuates his skill sets. And I think they did that. So I think they're on their way. Claypool definitely helps, but I'm with you. I want to see the rest of this offensive line, how it gets built out. Um, I think they're going to have a hard time replacing a Justin Fields. Now he's not a polished product. We all understand that. But for the first time in a year and a half, I see development having been started there. And I think there's enough there to endorse him going forward. Randy, I was going to ask you how much better the Miami Dolphins are today, but I think we kind of touched on that after what they brought in with Bradley Chubb, where, where they stand in the hierarchy to, of that division in the AFC. So I'll switch gears just a bit here, a trade that we haven't talked about, that I, I've written a lot about this week, talked about earlier in the podcast, the Christian McCaffrey edition by the San Francisco 49ers. It, it really feels like the kind of move that elevates them into that number two seed in the NFC as far as the second best team in that conference improves their Super Bowl chances, in my opinion. What do you make of Christian McCaffrey and the kind of impact he has the chance to make with San Francisco? Well, for me, it's an easy one. I don't think you can really di dispute the skill set he brings and his playmaking ability. I don't know that he's a running back. I don't know that he's a receiver. I don't know what he is, but he's everything. And and for a, to, to get a weapon like that in week eight of the NFL season is a giant shot in the arm for an offense that frankly hasn't been dynamic at all. So I think they still have some issues at quarterback. Uh, I, I understand Jimmy G is what they have to play the rest of the season with, but they've developed now a guy who I think can give them an identity on offense. He's a moving part, much like Debo Samuel, that Kyle Shanahan has shown a willingness to work in a lot of places. A lot of coaches will not work in parts and weapons like Kyle has their, their system is sacred. Kyle's not like that. He will work in offensive playmakers in his system to get them the ball and to identify some matchups that they can actually be productive in. So I think going forward, yes, he gives them a really good chance. I like their skill set now and all their options that they have on offense. It's a matter of can he stay healthy? And that's really the only question we've all had about McCaffrey. Yeah, he's worth the money if he's healthy, but it's been a big if. And obviously Carolina going forward didn't think it was worth the contract that they gave him a year or two ago. So that's that's the rub. It's always health with McCaffrey. And if he can stay healthy, I think the 49ers are well on their way to being one of the top teams in the, in the NFC for sure. Oh, I totally agree. Before I let you go, Randy, did any of the teams, not just on Tuesday at the deadline, but in the moves leading up to the deadline, did any team help their Super Bowl chances the most out of anybody else who really helped themselves the most after the deadline? Well, uh, other than Miami, who we've talked about, I do think that the Buffalo Bills made themselves better. I think the back that they got from Indianapolis, Naheem, Naheem Hines. Hines, is yep. exactly what they need in the system that they've evolved into at, in Buffalo. I like Zach Moss. He's a nice inside runner who can you know, make some people miss. Hines is a factor in the passing game. Hines is a guy they're going to be able to do some things with outside the box and really give them some big playability. I think he was sought after by several teams. So people had identified him early on as an offensive weapon and a piece, much like what McCaffrey brings to San Francisco. I think Hines brings to Buffalo on a little lesser level. But I think Buffalo did what they thought they could do to move forward, and I think it helped them. Yeah, I reported early in the day on Tuesday that they were working the phones trying to find a running back, but the price had to be right. The fit yep. had to be right. Right. Name Hines was both. And, yep. you know, I spoke to an executive on Tuesday afternoon who told me that he walks into mm -hmm. that building as their most complete running back. Just like you said, no, no. as a pass catcher, a runner, a, a big play threat. I'm going to be really fascinated, Randy, to see how they use him when you balance out with a James Cook and maybe Isaiah McKenzie at times, mm -hmm. how they use Naeem Hines and how close he is to being that three down back for an offense where they just come at you in waves over and over throughout yeah. the game, weapons on top of weapons on top of weapons. I think Hines makes them even tougher to beat. I think you're right about that. Yeah, no doubt. I th I said for the last couple of years, every time I would see Hines with the Colts, I'd say, why don't we see this kid more? Why is he not doing more? And I understand they have, you know, Jonathan, the, the runner who some people think is the best back in football, but this kid gives you so many options. And I agree. I think Buffalo now gets to expand on that and we might get to see a, a more steady diet of Hines that could be a difference maker if given the opportunities. 
He's Randy Mueller, 2000 NFL Executive of the Year. He's a contributor to Heavy Sports. We're thrilled to have him. And I'm going to be thrilled at some point to take the Lombardo Lounge on the road for scotch and cigars on the deck. Mm-hmm. If the invite's there, Randy, we, we got to make this happen. Talk to Chris. Talk to your people. Let's make it happen. Let's get this show on the road. We'll do it. I'm going to put it on the calendar for later this summer. Well, I would appreciate it. Randy, thanks for uh, taking a few minutes. We'll talk to you further up the road, my friend. Thanks, Matt. Really great stuff there from Randy Mueller. I always enjoy talking football with Randy, whether it's on the podcast, for any column that I'm writing, check all those out at heavy.com, or just picking up the phone and and talking about the biggest moves in the NFL. I really enjoy it. And and nobody had a bigger performance this week, and one of the greatest performances of the NFL season point blank so far. Nobody had a better week than the winner of this week's Lombardo Trophy. That's new San Francisco 49ers running back Christian McCaffrey. He takes home the Lombardo Trophy. Who else could it be? As we've said, it was wholly obvious when the Niners traded for McCaffrey that he was made to play for Kyle Shanahan, made to play in that 49ers scheme, especially with all those horizontal run concepts, especially with how often they throw the ball to the running back out of the backfield. McCaffrey does it all. He's the back made to capitalize in that offense, made to make that offense run. But what McCaffrey did in his second game in a 49ers uniform and his first game after having a full week with the playbook, it was historic. He was the first player in 17 years since LaDainian Tomlinson did it to rush for a touchdown, catch a touchdown pass, and throw a touchdown. I had an NFL personnel executive tell me last week that the 49ers are probably the biggest winners at the trade deadline, and McCaffrey makes San Francisco, quote, quite a bit better. That may be an understatement. Because when I look at the NFC in this conference where there's no clear-cut second-best team behind the Eagles, no complete team, no team with a championship pedigree that I trust in January in the postseason to really challenge the Eagles, I think McCaffrey elevates the 49ers to that level as Philadelphia's biggest challenge, their biggest hurdle to get to a Super Bowl. They are the one team with a loaded defense all kinds of talent at the skill positions, one of the premier tight ends in the game, a running back who can be a true difference maker that you can feel comfortable investing a top draft pick in. You're not the New York Giants taking Saquon Barkley number two overall with a roster that has gaping holes on both sides and an aging quarterback you're trying to prop up. No, no, no. The 49ers were one piece away from being a potential Super Bowl team, and they went and got that big piece. McCaffrey can be a difference maker there. He certainly was before he got to San Francisco. He was really the only thing going, the only thing that made that offense go in Carolina where he was wasting away. Now, he's the type of player that can elevate Kyle Shanahan and the 49ers to even new heights. Pick of the week. Let's try to build some momentum here. This is a line that I don't really understand. The pick of the week is the reigning Super Bowl champion, the Los Angeles Rams, because somehow... The Rams are getting two and a half points against the Buccaneers in Tampa. I'm not sure if whoever is setting the lines has watched much of Tom Brady and the Buccaneers so far this season or in the last couple weeks, but I just don't see them getting back on track or turning this season around. I, I know Christian McCaffrey had a big day against the Rams last week for the 49ers, and there's but there's still a lot of talent there. Aaron Donald's still on that defense. Jalen Ramsey is still on that defense. This is still the team that knocked Tampa out of the postseason last January, ended their chances at a Super Bowl repeat, and this is a worse Tampa Bay team. I don't understand how the Buccaneers are favored here, especially after that disaster we saw against the Baltimore Ravens on Thursday night last week. I know the Buccaneers have Tom Brady, but he's not the same quarterback. Everybody I talk to says that he's not turning this around. There's no turning this back, that Father Time is finally catching up or caught up. I know Tampa's dealing with nagging injuries. And we go for covers here with the pick of the week. We're not just going for winners. We're going for covers. And the Rams getting two and a half seems like an easy cover. I'll take the Rams with the points, but there's a good chance that Los Angeles wins this game outright against the Buccaneers. So that's where I'm at with this week's pick of the week. This is a really fun show. Thanks, of course, as always, to my producer extraordinaire, Thomas Darrow, does a fantastic job getting this show up and running each and every week. He's an asset to the program, already becoming a friend. Thanks to Terrell Davis. Go check out arcade1up.com. Get your NFL blitz. And thanks, as always, to Randy Mueller. If you enjoy the podcast, please go ahead and subscribe in the Apple Podcast Store, Spotify, SoundCloud. 
YouTube, leave those five-star reviews. You can follow me on Twitter at Matt Lombardo NFL. You can read my work at heavy.com. Really enjoy this one. Can't wait to talk to you next week. Enjoy the games. I'm Matt Lombardo. I'll talk to you next week on the Matt Lombardo Show presented by Heavy Sports.